Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the first of ten episodes. It's not surprising, I suppose, when I happen to have dinner with my old friend Rutherford recently, that our conversation should turn to Glory Conway. We'd known him at school, and Rutherford had continued the friendship at Oxford. Conway was one of the most remarkable men either of us had ever known. He was certainly outstanding as a youth. He was tall, extremely good-looking, excelled at games and academically. A rather sentimental schoolmaster once referred to his exploits as glorious, and from that arose his nickname. He'd had a brilliant career at Oxford, had served throughout the war, and had later joined the consular service. Then, a year or so before my meeting with Rutherford, I'd heard a rumour that Conway had been killed in an air crash. I suppose you don't know the details about his death, I said. His death? said Rutherford. Who told you he was dead? He was very much alive a few months ago. Are you sure of that? I said. How do you know? Because I travelled with him from Shanghai to Honolulu last November. He refilled my glass and offered me another cigar. Hmm. It happened this way. I was in the Far East in the autumn. I was on a train. I happened to get into conversation with a very charming mother superior. She was travelling to her convent, and because I spoke a little French, she seemed to enjoy chattering to me about her work and affairs in general. But while we talked, she chanced to mention a fever case that had been admitted to the mission hospital some weeks back. A man they thought must be a European, although he was in Chinese clothes of the poorest kind, could give no account of himself and had no papers. Well, in the end, she invited me to visit the mission and meet this mysterious stranger. Well, to cut a long story short, I did so, and the mother superior, the resident doctor, took me across to the hospital. The place was spotlessly clean, and as we walked past the beds, the doctor explained the cases. And when at last we got to our mystery patient, all I could see was the back of the man's head. He was apparently asleep. The mother superior told me to speak to him in English, so I said, Good afternoon, which was the first thing I could think of. Well, the man looked up and replied, Good afternoon. I recognised him at once, despite his beard and the fact that he was very changed, that it was years since I'd seen him. He was Conway. Of course, when I told the doctor and the mother superior that I knew the man, they were pretty excited. But though I called out Conway's name and told him my own, he looked at me without any sign of recognition whatsoever. It was clear that he'd completely lost his memory. Rutherford went on to tell me that in the end he stayed there over a fortnight, hoping that somehow or other he might induce Conway to remember things. He didn't succeed, but Conway regained his physical health, and they talked a good deal. He was quite cheerful, in a vague sort of way, seemed glad enough to have company. To the suggestion that Rutherford should take him home, he simply said that he didn't mind. So passages were arranged for both of them on a liner leaving for San Francisco. As you can imagine, my dear fellow, said Rutherford, we remade our old friendship on the boat, I told him as much as I knew about him, and he listened to it all very closely. I think he was trying desperately to rediscover himself. Rutherford leaned over and offered to fill my glass again, but I shook my head. Conway's strange history had completely absorbed my attention. Go on, I said. What happened next? Well, at Yokohama the ship filled up, and among the new passengers was Seif King, a pianist, en route for a concert tour in the States. And uh, a few days out from Japan, Seif King was prevailed upon to give a piano recital on board. Well, of course, Conway and I went to hear him. He played very well. Some Brahms and Scarlatti and uh, a lot of Chopin. And then he left for piano and he was just going to the door when, when Conway sat down at the keyboard and was playing some rapid, lively piece I didn't recognise. But it drew Seif King back like a shot. 
Mr. Conway, you must tell me what that was you were playing. Well, Conway made what appeared to be a tremendous mental effort to remember. I think it's a Chopin study, he said. My dear Mr. Conway, I can tell you positively that it isn't. I know everything of Chopin's that exists, and I can assure you that he never wrote what you have just played. He might well have done so because it is utterly in his style, but he just didn't. I challenge you to show me the score in any of the editions. Oh, yes. I remember now. It was never printed. I only know it myself from meeting a man who used to be one of Chopin's pupils. Rutherford looked at me to see my reaction. Good heavens, I said. But Chopin died in 1849. Exactly. The whole incident was quite extraordinary, but there was still the music to be explained. If it wasn't what Conway said it was, then what was it? Anyway, that night, the night after the recital, Conway got back his memory. We had both gone to bed, and I was lying awake when he came into my cabin and told me. He said he could call everything to mind. He said he wanted to tell me the whole story. It was mid-morning and hot sunshine when he had finished, and during the next 24 hours he fell in a good many gaps. About the middle of the following night, the ship was due to reach Honolulu. We had drinks in my cabin the evening before. He left me about 10 o'clock, and I never saw him again. Three months later, he wrote to me from Bangkok. He said he was about to set out on a long journey. And that was all. I've heard nothing since. But quite soon after Conway left the ship, I started making notes. Later, as certain aspects of the thing began to grip me, I had the urge to do more, to fashion the written fragments into a single narrative. And by that, I don't mean that I invented or altered anything. There was quite enough material in what he told me. Rutherford went to an attaché case and took out a bundle of typed manuscript. Here it is. You can make what you like of it. And this is the story as I learned it from Rutherford's typescript. The story of Hugh Conway and the Valley of Lost Horizon. It began in May 1931. The situation in Baskul had become much worse, and on the 20th, aircraft arrived to evacuate the white residents. These numbered about 80, and most were safely transported across the mountains in troop carriers to Peshawar. A few miscellaneous aircraft were also employed. In one of these, at about 10 a.m., four passengers embarked. Miss Roberta Brinklow, a missionary originally from London, Henry D. Barnard, an American citizen, Hugh Conway, and Captain Charles Mallinson, both of the consular service. Conway was 37. He was tall, deeply bronzed, with slate blue eyes. That day he was tired. He'd been packing and destroying documents throughout the whole of the day and night preceding the evacuation, so he spread himself indulgently in the well-sprung seat and settled back to doze. It was after the flight had lasted more than an hour that Mallinson, his junior, said he thought the pilot wasn't keeping a straight course. Mallinson sat immediately in front. He was in his middle twenties, pink-cheeked, intelligent, without being intellectual. Conway opened his eyes drowsily and said that whatever the course taken, the pilot presumably knew best. Half an hour later, when weariness and the drone of the engines had lulled him nearly to sleep, Manson disturbed him again. I say, Conway, I thought Fanner was piloting us. Well, isn't he? The chap turned his head just now. I'll swear it wasn't Fanner. Oh, it's hard to tell through that glass panel. But I'd know Fanner's face anywhere, Conway. Well, then, it must be somebody else. I don't see that it matters. When we arrive in Peshawar very soon, you can make the fellow's acquaintance and ask him all about himself. 
But at this rate, Conway, we shan't get to Pesharo at all. The man, whoever he is, is, is right off his course. Suddenly, the plane lurched slightly and began to descend. Mallinson rose abruptly, and in doing so, he bumped his head against the roof and woke Barnard, the American who had been dozing in his seat at the other side of the narrow gangway. Mallinson peered through the window. Great Scott! Look down there! Conway looked. The view was certainly not what he'd expected, if indeed he'd expected anything. Instead of trim, geometrically laid out hangars, nothing was visible but an opaque mist, veiling an immense sun-browned desolation. Long corrugated mountain ridges could be picked out in the distance. Not wishing to alarm the others, Conway leaned over and spoke in Mallinson's ear. I don't recognize this part of the world. Looks as though you're right. The man has lost his way. The plane was swooping down at a tremendous speed, and as it did so, the air grew hotter. The scorched earth below was like an oven with a door suddenly opened. The American half rose in his seat. Looks like he wants to land, he said. But he can't, said Mallinson. He'd be simply mad if he tried to. He'll crash. He'll crash. But the pilot did land. A small cleared space opened by the side of a gully, and with considerable skill the machine was jolted and heaved to a standstill. What happened after that, however, was even more puzzling. A swarm of bearded tribesmen came forward from all directions. They blocked the cabin entrance and prevented anybody from getting out except the pilot. Meanwhile, cans of petrol were fetched from a dump close by and emptied into the tanks. Grins and shouting met the cries of the four imprisoned passengers, and the slightest attempt to get out provoked a menacing movement from a score of rifles. The midday sun, blazing on the roof of the cabin, grilled the air inside till the occupants were almost fainting with the heat. And when the tanks were at last screwed up, the pilot climbed back into the cockpit. One of the tribesmen swung the propellers, and the plane jolted forward. It rose high into the haze, then turned east, as if setting a course. A handful of passengers sat staring at each other, struck dumb with amazement. It was scarcely possible, but it had happened. A score of unanswered questions hung almost tangibly in the air about them. Who was the pilot? Why were they being kidnapped? And where was he taking them? Above all, where was he taking them? That was episode one of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the second of ten episodes. In May 1931, Hugh Conway and three other people were being evacuated by air from a trouble spot in northwest India. On the way, they discovered that their pilot was unknown to them and that they were off course. They landed in wild country. Strange tribesmen prevented them from getting out. The plane's tanks were filled, and the machine took off again for an unknown destination. The most extraordinary business. Mallinson, Conway's junior in the consulate they were leaving, developed the theory that they were being kidnapped for ransom. That sort of trick is by no means new, he told the others. Though this particular technique is certainly original. There have been plenty of kidnappings before. A good many of them have ended up all right. The tribesmen keep you in some lair in the mountains until relatives or friends pay up. You're treated quite decently, I gather. Barnard, the American, wasn't particularly impressed with this theory. Well, gentlemen, I dare say this is a cute idea on somebody's part, but I can't exactly figure your Air Force has covered itself with glory. It's had one of its aircraft stolen from under its nose. And, by the way, I should like to know what this fellow did with a real pilot. Conway agreed tentatively with Mallinson's kidnapping theory. He also agreed to some extent with Barnard's strictures on the Air Force. Though one can see, of course, how it may have happened, he said. 
with the place and the commotion it was during the evacuation, one man in flying kit would look very much like another. And it's pretty obvious that this fellow knows how to fly. There wouldn't have been any reason to suspect him. During this conversation, the fourth member of the party, Miss Roberta Brinkler, was sitting tight-lipped and straight-backed. She was a small, middle-aged woman, toughened after many years of missionary work in the Far East. Conway bent forward and spoke in her ear. We seem to be in a strange fix, but I'm glad that you're taking it calmly. I don't really think anything dreadful is going to happen to us. I have full confidence in you, Mr Conway. I'm sure nothing terrible will happen if you can prevent it. All afternoon the plane soared through the thin mist of the upper atmosphere, far too high to give clear sight of what lay beneath. Sometimes, at longish intervals, the veil was torn for a moment to display the jagged outline of a peak or the glint of some unknown river. The direction could be determined roughly from the sun. It was still east, with an occasional twist to the north. Suddenly, after they'd been flying for several hours, Mallinson leapt to his feet. Look here! How are we bound to sit here twiddling our thumbs while this maniac does everything he damn well wants? What's to stop us smashing that glass and having it out with him? Nothing at all, said Conway. Except that he may be armed and we're not. And in any case, none of us would know how to bring the machine to Earth afterwards. I am right about that, aren't I? None of us can fly an aeroplane, can we? There was a murmur of agreement. All right, so none of us can fly, said Mallinson. But this business is getting on my nerves. Can't we make the fellow come down? How do you suggest it should be done? Well, he's there, isn't he, about six feet away from us, and we're three men to one. We might at least force him to tell us what the game is. Very well. We'll see. Conway took a few steps forward to the glass partition and tapped on it. The response was exactly as he'd expected. The panel slid sideways, and the barrel of a revolver was pushed through. Conway retreated without arguing the point. There seemed nothing that any of them could do. Conway went back to his seat, stretched out at full length, and went to sleep. When he woke some time later, he became aware of a slight dizziness and heart thumping. His chest became restricted and breathing was difficult. He looked out. The sky had cleared completely, and in the light of late afternoon, he saw a vision which for the moment snatched the remaining breath from his lungs. Far away, at the very limit of distance lay range upon range of snow peaks, apparently floating upon vast levels of cloud. They compassed the whole arc of the circle, merging towards the west in a horizon that was fierce, almost garish in colouring. One by one, the others woke up. You recognise where we are, Conway? said Barnard. No, I've never been anywhere near here before. I think it likely that we're still in India, and that that range of mountains over there is the Karakorams. Look here, Conway, said Mallinson. We'd better drop the kidnapping theory. We're far past the frontier country by now. There aren't any tribes living round here. The fellows are raving lunatic. Would anybody accept a lunatic flying to this sort of country? It's very well organised lunacy, you know, said Conway. Don't forget the landing for petrol. And for the moment, appalling as the situation was, Conway felt he didn't want to resent anything that proceeded with such intriguing purpose. This feeling was strengthened when Miss Brinkler looked up at them and said, It is the will of God. And there came over him too as he stared at those superb mountains, a glow of satisfaction that there were such places still left on earth, distant, inaccessible. Twilight fell, then suddenly night. A full moon rose, touching each peak in succession until the long horizon glittered against the blue-black sky. Mallinson began to get worried about the petrol. How far would full tanks have taken us, Conway? About a thousand miles. If I'm right, and these mountains are the Karakorabs, we shall be able to reach some part of Tibet before the petrol gives out. But we've got some time to go yet. Conway closed his eyes and went peacefully to sleep again. Bit by bit, the others dozed too. 
Suddenly, they were all awakened by a lurch of the machine. Conway's head struck the window. A returning lurch sent him floundering between the two tiers of seats. It was much colder. The first thing he did automatically was to glance at his watch. It showed half past one. He must have been asleep for some time. His ears were full of a loud flapping sound. The engines had been shut off. The plane was rushing against the gale. Then he could see the earth, quite close, vague and grey, racing past underneath. Mallinson clutched at the back of a seat. He's going to crash! Watch out! The plane made brief contact with the earth, rose, fell heavily back, trundling unevenly forwards. Mallinson groaned during ten seconds of crashing and swaying. Something was heard to strain and snap and one of the tyres exploded. The machine wheeled round and came to rest. Mallinson wrenched open the door and prepared to make the jump down to earth. He turned to the others. This looks like the end of the world. A moment later, chilled and shivering, they all agreed with him as he left the plane. With no sound in their ears save the fierce gusts of wind and their own crunching footsteps, they felt themselves at the mercy of something savage. The moon had disappeared, and starlight lit a tremendous emptiness, heaving with wind, a bleak world, mountain high. Mallinson was already making for the cockpit. I'm going to tackle him right away. He clambered up to the cockpit, but after a few seconds dropped down again. I say, Conway? Something wrong. I think the fellow's ill or dead or something. Come up and look. I took his revolver at any rate. Better give it to me, said Conway. And he hoisted himself up. Peering in, he could just see the pilot. Huddled forward, his head sprawling over the controls. He shook him, unfastened his helmet and loosened the clothes around his neck. Yes. Something's happened to him. We must get him out. With Barnard and Mallinson helping, the pilot was taken from his seat and lifted to the ground. He was unconscious, not dead. Possibly a heart attack, said Conway. We can do very little for him out here. There's no shelter from this infernal wind. Better get him inside the plane, and ourselves too. I haven't an idea where we are, and it's hopeless to make a move until daylight. They carried the man into the cabin and laid him along the gangway between the seats. The interior wasn't much warmer than the outside, but at least it was a shelter from the wind. It wasn't an ordinary wind. It was like a frenzy that lived all round them, tilting the loaded machine and shaking it viciously. His heart's very faint, said Conway. Miss Brinklow groped in her handbag. I wonder if this would be any use. She held out a small bottle of brandy. I always carry it with me in case of accidents. Thank you, Miss Brinklow. Just the stuff. After a moment, the slightest movement of eyelids was visible. As Conway kept a vigil throughout that gale tormented night, he reasoned the situation out to himself. He guessed that the flight had progressed far beyond the western range of the Himalayas. If that were so, they should by now have reached the loftiest and least hospitable place on earth, the Tibetan Plateau, a vast, uninhabited and largely unexplored region. It was probable the nearest human settlement was hundreds of miles away. They had no food. They were unarmed, except for one revolver. The airplane was damaged and almost fuel-less. They had no clothes suited to the icy cold. In short, it was absolutely essential for the pilot to be kept alive. The night dragged on. As Conway watched in the early dawn, the valley began to take shape, revealing a floor of rock and shingle sloping upwards. At last, the sun rose into a sky of deep delphinium blue. As the air grew warmer, the others wakened, and Conway suggested carrying the pilot into the open where the sharp, dry air and the sunlight might help to revive him. This was done, and they began a second and pleasanter vigil. Eventually, the man opened his eyes and began to speak. His four passengers stooped over him, listening to sounds that were meaningless, except to Conway, who occasionally made answers. The man became weaker. Conway put the brandy bottle to his lips again, but the spirit seemed to do him no good. About the middle of the morning, he died. Conway stayed crouching by his side. 
Then he straightened up and joined the others. I'm sorry to say he told me very little, he said, merely that we were in Tibet. I didn't understand him very well, but he said something about a lamasery near here, um, a sort of Buddhist monastery where we could get food and shelter. Shangri-La, he called it. There seems to be an obvious way along the valley, but let's hope it's not halfway up that mountain. Conway's remarks served to fix their attention on the glittering cone-shaped peak towards which the valley pointed. And then their gaze turned to a stare. For they could see, far away, approaching them down the slope, the figures of men. And as the figures moved down the valley, they revealed themselves to be a party of a dozen or more, carrying with them a hooded chair. That was episode two of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the third of ten episodes. In the spring of 1931, whilst being evacuated by air from a trouble spot in North India, consular official Hugh Conway and his three fellow passengers found themselves in the hands of an armed pilot they'd never seen before. He flew the plane far into the remotest mountains of Tibet, where after a crash landing, he died. Then the four stranded people saw that they were not alone. On a glittering peak across a valley, a party of men were coming towards them, carrying a hooded chair. As the procession drew nearer, Conway left his own party and walked towards them, though not hurriedly, for he knew that Orientals enjoy the ritual of meeting and like to take their time over it. Halting when a few yards off, he bowed with due courtesy. A robed figure stepped from the chair, came forward with dignified deliberation and held out his hand. Conway responded, observing that the man was an elderly Chinese, grey-haired, clean-shaven and wearing a silk-embroidered gown. I am from the Lamasri of Shangri-La, he said. Conway bowed again and explained the circumstances that had brought him and his three companions to such an unfrequented part of the world. It is indeed a remarkable story, said the Chinese. We will see to your plane and the dead pilot. My name is Chang. If you would be so good as to present me to your friends. Conway turned to the others who were regarding this encounter with varying degrees of astonishment. Uh, Miss Brinklow, LMS, um, London Missionary Service, Mr. Barnard, who is an American, Mr. Mallinson, and my own name is Conway. We're British Consular Service. We're all glad to see you. Indeed, we were just about to make our way to your lamasery, if you could give us directions for the journey. There is no need for that, said Chang. I shall be delighted to act as your guide. Our stay won't be long, said Mallinson. We shall pay for anything we have, and we should like to hire some of your men to help us on our journey back. We want to return to civilization as soon as possible. The Chinese bowed and returned to his chair. The journey to Shangri-La was begun. All morning the climb proceeded slowly and by easy gradients, but at such height the physical effort was considerable, and nobody had the energy to spare for talk. About a couple of miles along the valley the ascent grew steeper, and by this time the sun was overclouded and a silvery mist obscured the view. Thunder and avalanches resounded from the snow fields above. The air became chill, and then with the sudden changefulness of mountain regions bitterly cold. Shortly afterwards the party halted, and the Tibetans began uncoiling ropes and linking the party together in mountaineering fashion. But the next stage, though occasionally exciting, was less arduous than might have been expected. 
The track consisted of a cut along the flank of a rock wall. Mercifully, the mist obscured both the height of the rock above them and the depth of the abyss on the other side. The path was scarcely more than two feet wide in places. After a while, it started to turn downhill at first gently, and then more sharply. At one spot, Conway found some Edelweiss, but when he showed it to the others, Mallinson said, Good heavens, Conway, you fancy you're pottering about the Alps? What sort of devil's kitchen are we making for? If you'd been through the war as I have, said Conway, you'd realise there are times when the most comfortable thing is to do nothing at all. Things happen to you and you just let them happen. I'm afraid I don't find it as easy as you do to accept the situation, said Mallinson. The ground levelled out, and the party stepped from the mist into clear, sunny air. Ahead, and only a short distance away, lay the Lamasery of Shangri-La. To Conway it might have been a vision. It was indeed a strange sight. A group of coloured pavilions clung to the mountainside with the chance delicacy of a flower petal. Above them rose a grey rock bastion, and beyond that, in a dazzling pyramid, soared the snow slopes of a tremendous mountain. Below the pavilions, the mountain wall continued to drop, almost sheer to the valley. The floor of the valley, hazily distant, welcomed the eye with greenness. Sheltered from winds and surveyed by the Lamasry, it looked to Conway a delightfully favoured place. He never remembered exactly how he and the others arrived at the Lamasry. That thin air had a dreamlike texture, and he only vaguely recollected surprise at finding the interior spacious, well warmed, and quite clean. But there was no time to do more than notice these things, for the Chinese, Chang, had left his chair and was already leading the party through various antechambers. I will show you to your apartments, he said. No doubt you would like bars. Our accommodation is simple, but I hope adequate. Afterwards I shall be greatly honoured if you will all join me at dinner. And then, if you don't mind, said Marinson, we'll make our plans for getting away. The sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned. The appointments of Shangri-La proved to be all that any of them could have wished, certainly more than they expected. That a Tibetan monastery should possess a system of central heating was perhaps surprising enough, but it was the combination of Western and Eastern that struck Conway as most odd. The bath, for instance, was of a delicate green porcelain, a product, according to the inscription, of Akron, Ohio. Yet he was attended by a valet in Chinese fashion. His ears and nostrils were cleansed, and a thin silk swab passed under his lower eyelids. The four passengers met again at dinner. The room in which Chang received them was admirably proportioned and sparingly adorned with tapestries and one or two fine pieces of lacquer. Light was from paper lanterns motionless in the still air. The meal was an excellent one of Chinese food, beautifully prepared and meticulously served. They were all hungry and ate well. Afterwards, Conway lit a cigarette. You seem a very fortunate community, he said to Chung. You're certainly very hospitable to strangers. I don't imagine, though, that you receive them often. Seldom indeed, Mr. Conway. It is not a travelled part of the world. You put the matter mildly. It seemed to me as I came the most isolated spot I ever set eyes on. A separate culture might flourish here without contamination from the outside world. And what do you understand by contamination, Mr. Conway? Oh, dance bands, cinemas, sky signs. Your plumbing is quite rightly as modern as you can get it. The only certain boon to my mind that the East can take from the West. I often think that the Romans are fortunate. Their civilization reached as far as hot baths without touching the fatal knowledge of machinery. Uh, Miss Brinklow interrupted him. Please, will you tell us about the monastery, she said. 
As a missionary, I'm interested in the religious organization of your community. Those of us in full Lamahood number about 50, said Chang. There are a few others like myself who have not yet attained the complete initiation. We are half Lamas. I see. Thank you, said Miss Brinkler. Tell me, what do you all believe in? <laughs> Isn't that rather a big question, said Conway. But I, I must admit that I share Miss Brinkler's curiosity. If I were to put it into a very few words, my dear sir, said John, I should say that our prevalent belief is in moderation. We preach the virtue of avoiding excess of all kinds. In the valley which I have seen, several thousand inhabitants live under our order, and we have found that this principle makes for a very considerable degree of happiness. All this is very interesting, said Mallinson, but I really think it's time we began to discuss our plans for getting away. We want to return to India as soon as possible. How many porters can we be supplied with? For a long moment, Chung did not answer. Then he said, Unfortunately, Mr. Mallinson, I hardly think the matter could be arranged immediately. But something has got to be arranged. Our friends and relatives will be worrying about us. We should like to set out not later than tomorrow. Presumably, some of your people could escort us. We should make it well worth their while, of course. And it will be a good idea to send messages ahead. How far away is the nearest radio station or telegraph line? Chang's wrinkled face seemed to have acquired a look of infinite patience. But he didn't reply. Well, where do you send to when you want anything? Once again, his question was met with silence. Suddenly, Mallinson thrust back his chair. I don't feel that any of you are really trying to help me. I'm only asking a simple question. When you had all these modern baths installed, how did they get here? You won't tell me. It's part of the general mystery, I suppose. Conway, why don't you get at the truth? Conway felt himself waking from a trance. Um, I think we'd all better adjourn this discussion till tomorrow. Barnard... Will you look after Mallinson? He's all in. And I'm sure you're in need of sleep too, Miss Brinklow. I shall follow you soon. Good night. He hustled them out of the room and turned to his host. No, sir, I don't want to detain you long, so I'd better come to the point. My friend is impetuous, but he's quite right to make things clear. Our return journey has to be arranged, and we can't do it without help from you. Now, I'm not suggesting that we leave tomorrow. These things obviously take time, but will you tell me how soon you can let us have porters? Well, my dear sir, I very much doubt whether you will easily find men willing to undertake such a journey. They have their homes in the valley, and they don't care to leave them for long and arduous trips outside. They can be prevailed upon to do so, though, can't they? said Conway. Weren't you setting out on a journey when we met you this morning? There was no response to this. Then a sudden incredible thought struck him. I understand. So it was not a chance meeting. You came there deliberately to intercept us. You must have known of our arrival beforehand. But the question is, my dear Chang, the question is, how? Oh, for a moment, as Conway stared into the eyes of the Lama, he knew that he had stumbled onto the most significant aspect so far of their strange adventure. You are clever, Chang said, but not entirely correct. For that reason, I should advise you not to worry your friends with your speculations. Believe me, neither you nor they are in any danger at Shangri-La. That was episode three of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the fourth of ten episodes.
Conway and Mallinson of the Consular Service, together with Miss Brinklow, a missionary and an American called Barnard, had been flown out of a travel spot in North India. But the pilot was not the RAF officer they knew and expected. He was a stranger who flew them east into the wildest heights of Tibet, crash-landed and died, leaving them to seek shelter in the strange monastery at Shangri-La, to which they were brought by a lama called Chang. We desire nothing more, Mr. Conway, than that you and your companions should enjoy every moment of your stay here. Tomorrow you will find Shangri-La even more interesting. If you are fatigued, you will find there are few better places in the world. Next day, Conway didn't pass on to his friends his conclusion that their arrival had been in some way expected by the inhabitants of Shangri-La. One part of him still insisted there was something distinctly odd about the place, that the attitude of Chang was far from reassuring, and that the party were virtually prisoners. But the truth was that the puzzle of Shangri-La and of his own arrival there was beginning to exercise a fascination over him. And when he rose in the morning and saw the soft blue of the sky through his window, he wouldn't, as Chang had predicted, have chosen to be anywhere else on earth. He was glad to find that on Barnard and Miss Brinklow a night's rest had had a heartening effect. Even Mallinson had acquired a touch of grudging complacency. I suppose we shan't get away today after all, he said, unless somebody looks pretty sharp about it. I think we'd better wait and see what the day brings, said Conway. Perhaps it was too optimistic to expect them to do anything last night. As they were finishing breakfast, Chang entered and, with a little bow, began the exchange of politely conventional greetings. Mallinson waited impatiently until Conway and the Lama had stopped speaking. Then he said, Now, about those porters. I want to start hunting round for them right away. This morning, if you've no objection. But, my dear Mr. Mallinson, I am sorry to tell you that it would be of little use. I fear we have no men available who would be willing to accompany you so far from their homes. But great Scott, man, you don't suppose you're going to take that for an answer, do you? I'm afraid he's right, Chang, said Conway. This sort of prevarication won't do, you know. We can't stay indefinitely, and we can't get away by ourselves. What, then, do you propose? My dear sir, may I make this suggestion? From time to time we receive consignments of goods from across the mountains. Such a consignment is expected to arrive shortly. As the men who make the delivery will afterwards return, it seems to me that you might manage to come to some arrangement with them. Indeed, I cannot think of any other plan. Uh, when do they arrive? said Mallinson. The exact date is, of course, impossible to forecast. You have yourself had experience of the difficulty of movement in this part of the world. It might be a month from now, probably not more than two months. Two months, said Mallinson. Two months in this place? It's preposterous. Conway, you surely can't agree to that. I am sorry, said Chan. I do not wish to offend. The Lamasri continues to offer all of you its utmost hospitality for as long as you have the misfortune to remain. I can say no more. And, gathering his gown about him in a little gesture of finality, he left them. They spent the rest of the morning discussing the matter. I'm past arguing about it, said Mallinson. You know how I feel. I've said all along there's something very strange about this business. It's crooked. I'd like to be out of it. You may be right, said Conway, but it looks as though we shall have to do as Chang suggested. We are virtually helpless. As for me, I don't see why two months here should be much worse than two months in any other isolated part of the world. 
We shall be missed, and we shall all have our names in the papers, but I can't think of anybody who will worry over me acutely. He turned to the others, as if inviting them to state their own cases. Mallinson offered no information, but Conway knew roughly how he was situated. He had parents and a girl in England. It made things hard. Barnard, on the other hand, accepted the situation with his habitual good humour. Well, reckon I'm pretty lucky myself, for that matter. Two months in the penitentiary won't kill me. Uh, folks in my hometown won't wink an eyelid. After their discussion, they all felt more settled in their minds. And when Chang approached them after lunch, none of them felt disposed to continue the squabble. He suggested they might care to be shown a little more of the Lamasery buildings. Shangri-La was not the first monastic institution Conway had inspected, but it was easily the largest and the most remarkable. He was enchanted. He recognised treasures that museums and millionaires would have bargained for. In the library, lofty and spacious, between twenty and thirty thousand books were housed in bays and alcoves. Mallinson, who had picked up a volume, said, I say, Conway, here's a map of the country. We have a collection of several hundred maps, said Chang. They are all open to your inspection, but perhaps I can save you trouble in one respect. You will not find Shangri-La marked on any. That's curious, said Conway. I wonder why. Now, there is a very good reason. I'm afraid that is all I can say. Uh, perhaps you would now like to take tea? The party fell in with a suggestion. They followed Chang through several courtyards to a scene of quite sudden and unmatched loveliness. From a colonnade, steps descended to a garden. Here, a lotus pool lay entrapped. The leaves, so closely set, they gave an impression of a floor of moist green tiles. Fringing the pool were posed a brass menagerie of lions, dragons and unicorns. Chang led the way into an open pavilion, which, to Conway's further delight, contained a harpsichord and a modern grand piano. You mean to tell me, said Barnard, that this piano was brought here by the route we came along yesterday? There is no other, said Chang. Then servants came forward with shallow bowls of scented tea. Along with the Tibetans, there also entered a girl in Chinese dress. She went at once to the harpsichord and began to play an 18th century gawat. As soon as the piece was finished, she bowed slightly and went out. You are pleased, Mr. Conway, said Chang. Who is she? said Manson. Her name is Lord Sen. She has much skill with Western keyboard music. I myself, she has not yet attained the full initiation into the Lama Hood. I should think not indeed, said Miss Brinklow. She looks hardly more than a child. So, you have women Lamas, then? Yes, Miss Brinklow. There are no sex distinctions among us. The rest of the tea drinking proceeded without conversation. Echoes of the harpsichord seemed still in the air, imposing a strange spell. Presently, Chang led the way from the pavilion. I hope the tour has been enjoyable, he said, and please consider the resources of the music room and library wholly at your disposal throughout your stay. That evening, after dinner, Conway left the others and strolled out into the calm, moon-washed courtyards. Shangri-La was lovely then. The air was cold and still, and the mountain that towered behind the Lamasery seemed much nearer than by day. But despite the beauty of the scene, Conway was ill at ease. He was puzzled. The half-truths and evasions that their questions had evoked hinted at strange possibilities. The whole amazing series of events that had happened to him and his three chance companions had swung into a sort of focus. 
He couldn't yet understand them, but he believed now that an explanation did exist. Passing along a cloister, he reached the terrace and looked over the valley. He gazed over the edge into the blue-black emptiness. The drop was horrifying, perhaps as much as a mile. He wondered if he would be allowed to descend and inspect the valley civilization that Chang had spoken of. Suddenly, on a flutter of air, there came sounds far below. Conway listened intently. He could hear gongs and trumpets, and also, though perhaps only in imagination, a massed wail of voices. The sounds faded on the veer of the wind, then returned only to fade again. Two Tibetans had padded across the terrace and were idling near the parapet. Good humoured fellows, they looked. Then, from far, far below in the valley, the whisper of gongs and trumpets rose again. And Conway heard one of the men question his companion. The answer came. They have buried Kalu. Conway, whose knowledge of Tibetan was very slight, hoped they would continue talking. He couldn't gather much from a single remark, and indeed, after a pause, other snatches of the conversation drifted across the courtyard. He died outside. Talu came through the air over the great mountains. Strangers he brought also. Though he went outside long ago, Shangri-La remembers him still. He obeyed the high ones of Shangri-La. Nothing more was said that Conway could interpret and after waiting some time, he went back to his own quarters. But he had heard enough to turn a key in the locked mystery. It had, of course, crossed his mind, but he had never really accepted it. Now he saw that, however fantastic it seemed, it must be accepted. That runaway flight had not been the meaningless exploit of a madman. It had been something planned, prepared, and carried out at the instigation of someone here at Shangri-La. The dead pirate who had brought them here was known by name to those who lived here. He had been one of them. His death was mourned. Everything, everything that had gone before and everything that was still happening to them pointed to a, a high directing intelligence bent upon its own purposes. There had been, as it were, a single arch of intention spanning the inexplicable hours and miles. But what was that intention? For what possible reason could four chance passengers in a British aeroplane be whisked away to this lost Tibetan valley? That was episode four of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the fifth of ten episodes. On his second evening in the Lama's Ray, Conway overheard a conversation between two Tibetans. He realized then that he and his companions had not arrived at Shangri La by chance. The mysterious pilot of their aircraft had acted under orders from the High Ones of Shangri La. Conway was troubled. He had resolved to discover what the plan was. Why four chance passengers in a British aircraft had been brought to these Tibetan solitudes. But one thing he decided instantly. He must tell nobody of the conversation he had chanced to overhear. Neither his companions, who could not help him, nor his hosts, who doubtless would not. And so the four captive visitors settled into a kind of daily routine and their first week in Shangri-La drew to its end. Well, I reckon some folks have to get used to worse places, Barnard remarked. And that was indeed one of the many lessons to be drawn from their uncalled-for adventure. The Lama, Chang, did his best to entertain them, and with his help the boredom was no more acute than on many a planned holiday. 
They had all become acclimatised to the atmosphere, finding it quite invigorating, so long as heavy exertion was avoided. They learned that the days were warm and the nights cold, that the Lamasery was almost completely sheltered from winds. Conway was glad to find that the valley below the Lamasery was not out of bounds, although the difficulties of the descent made unescorted visits impossible. In company with Chang, they all spent a whole day inspecting the green valley floor that looked so inviting from the cliff edge. They travelled in bamboo sedan chairs, swinging perilously over precipices, while the bearers in front and behind picked away nonchalantly down the steep track. The valley was nothing less than an enclosed paradise of amazing fertility. Though narrow, it had the luck to catch the sunlight at the hottest part of the day. As for the inhabitants, they were enchanting. They smiled and laughed as they passed the chaired strangers and had a friendly word for Chang. Altogether, Conway thought them one of the pleasantest communities he'd ever seen. Miss Brinklow had been watching for symptoms of pagan degradation and subjected the Buddhist temple they visited to a close scrutiny. When I get back, she said, I shall ask my society to send a missionary here, and if they grumble at the expense, I shall just bully them until they agree. But you yourself would be ideal for the job, said Mallinson. That is, of course, if you'd like working in a place like this. It's hardly a question of liking it, Mr. Mallinson. It's a matter of what one feels one ought to do. Anyhow, I don't see why I shouldn't make a beginning by studying the language. Um, can you lend me a book about it, Mr. Chang? Most certainly, madam, said Chang. And if I may say so, I think the idea an excellent one. When they ascended to Shangri-La that evening, he treated the matter as one of immediate importance. Miss Brinkler was at first a little daunted by the massive volume compiled by an industrious 19th century German, but she made a good beginning and was soon extracting grim satisfaction from her task. Conway, too, found much to occupy him. During the warm, sunlit days, he made full use of the library and music room. It was tempting to speculate on the method of selection and acquisition of books, and interesting to note that there were none that had been printed during the last decade. Chang, however, told him that the Lamasery had some recently published books, which would doubtless be added to the shelves eventually. They arrived at Shangri-La some months ago, he said. We keep ourselves fairly up to date, you see. <laughs> there are people who would hardly agree with you, said Conway. Quite a lot of things have happened in the world in the past few years, you know. Nothing of importance, my dear sir that could not have been foreseen ten years ago, or that will not be better understood ten years hence. You're not interested, then, in the latest developments of the world crisis? I shall be deeply interested in due course. You know, Chang, I believe I'm beginning to understand you. You're geared differently. That's what it is. Time means less to you than it does to most people. If I were in London, I wouldn't always be eager to see the latest hour-old newspaper. And you at Shangri-La are no more eager to see a year-old one. Both attitudes seem to me quite sensible. Oh, by the way, how long is it since you last had visitors here? Uh, that, Mr. Conway, I'm unfortunately unable to say. It was the usual ending to a conversation. Conway began to like Chang more and more as their meetings multiplied, though it puzzled him that he met so few of the Lamas. There was, of course, the girl who had played the harpsichord for them, Lord Sen. He saw her sometimes when he visited the music room, but she knew no English, and Conway was unwilling to disclose his own knowledge of Chinese. Mallinson, who sometimes came to listen to the music for want of anything better to do, found her a very baffling proposition. I can't think what she's doing here, he said. This lava business may be all right for an old fellow like Chang, but what's the attraction in it for a girl? How, how long has she been here, I wonder? 
I wonder too, said Conway. But it's one of those things we're not likely to be told. She doesn't appear to dislike being here. She doesn't appear to have feelings at all, for that matter. She's like a little ivory doll more than a human being. I, I wonder how old she is. I wouldn't put her under 13 or over 30. Closer than that, it would be impossible to go. And Chang, said Mallinson, how old would you say Chang is? Oh, anything between 49 and uh, 149. And so the days drifted by. Conway became extremely interested in the customs and habits of the valley population and spent many hours discussing them with Chang. Every descent into the fertile paradise confirmed the success of the system of government that had been evolved. The benevolent rule of the Lamas reappeared to need neither soldiers nor police to maintain itself. When Conway raised this point, Chang explained that crime was very rare, partly because everyone had sufficient of everything he could reasonably desire. Conway asked if there were never disputes about women. Only very rarely, because it would not be considered good manners to take a woman that another man wanted. Hmm. Well, supposing somebody wanted so badly he didn't give a damn whether it was good manners or not. Then, my dear sir, it would be good manners on the part of the other man to let him have her. And also on the part of the woman to be equally agreeable. You would really be surprised how the application of a little courtesy all round helps to smooth out these problems. While Conway and Miss Brinklow pursued their interests and Mallinson fretted, Barnard the American remained remarkably cheerful. To tell you the truth, Conway, said Mallinson, Barnard's constant joking is just about getting on my nerves. Isn't it rather lucky for us that he does take things so well? Personally, I think it's damn peculiar. What do you know about him? I mean, who he is and so on. Not much more than you do. I understood he came from Persia and was supposed to have been prospecting for oil. It's his way to take things easily. When the air evacuation was arranged, I had quite a job to persuade him to join us at all. Well, I'm going to see if I can find out anything else about friend Barnard, said Mallinson. I'll let you know if anything crops up. Some days later, Mallinson made a point of catching Conway alone. I say, Conway, about Barnard. Did you ever see his passport? Probably. I don't remember. Why? Well... I haven't exactly been minding my own business. Here, read this. He handed over a cutting from an American paper and Conway scanned it quickly. This is about a large-scale financial swindle. What about it? Now, look at this one. You see, the same story, but something is added. The police are looking for Chalmers Bryant and look, there's his picture. Remind you of anyone? Good heavens. It's Barnard. Exactly. The man we know as Barnard travelling presumably on a false passport. How did you come by these cuttings, Mallinson? Well, Barnard dropped a pocketbook this morning and, and Chang picked it up and gave it to me thinking it was mine. I couldn't help seeing it was stuffed with newspaper cuttings. Some of them fell out as I was handling the thing. And I don't mind admitting I, I looked at them. After all, newspaper clippings aren't private, are they? They were all about Bryant and the search for him. I'm afraid there isn't much room for doubt, Conway. One of the men we're cooped up with here is a criminal on the run from the police. Of course, if you're right, Marinson, said Conway, and the fellow really is Chalmers Bryant, it would account for a good deal of his contentment at being here. <laughs> he could hardly have found a better place to hide. Well, what are you going to do about it? I haven't much of an idea. Probably nothing at all. Saint or crook, we've got to make what we can of each other's company as long as we're here. I suppose that means your advice to me is to forget what I found out. 
Conway shrugged. Although he hadn't taken much interest in the case, he had an impression it would be a fairly bad one of its kind. All he knew was that the failure of the enormous Bryant Group in New York had resulted in losses of about a hundred million dollars. In some way or other, Bryant had been monkeying on Wall Street, and the result had been a warrant for his arrest, his escape to Europe, and extradition orders against him in half a dozen countries. As it turned out, Mallinson didn't have to hold his peace for very long. After dinner that evening, when Chang had left them and Miss Brinkler had turned to her grammar book, the three male exiles faced each other over coffee and cigars. It had become increasingly clear during the meal that it lay beyond Mallinson's power to treat the American as if nothing had happened. And it was equally clear that Barnard was aware of it. Don't care for me to leave those clippings lying around, he said. And suddenly he threw away his cigar. Well, okay. So now I guess you all know who I am. So, where do we go from here? That was episode five of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the sixth of ten episodes. Time seemed to have lost much of its urgency and dominion in this remote lamaserie of Shangri-La. Cut off from the outside world, men lived whole decades heedless of the turmoils of the world at large and gathered their news only when it had become history and was enshrined in print on fine paper between cloth covers. This timelessness suited Conway, Miss Sprinklow and the American Barnard, but it irked Mallinson dreadfully and drove him to make mischief between his companions. He discovered that Barnard was really Chalmers Bryant, a large-scale financial swindler on the run from the police. Confronted by Mallinson, Barnard coolly laid his cards on the table and admitted that he was Bryant. Miss Sprinklow looked up from her book. I'm sure I don't care who you are, Mr. Barnard, though I must say I guessed all along that you were travelling incognito. I remember when Mr. Conway said we should all have our names in the papers, you said it wouldn't affect you. I thought then that Barnard probably wasn't your real name. Ah, you're a cute detective, ma'am, and... Well, I'm not sorry you boys have found me out. So long as none of you had an inkling, we could all have managed. But considering how we're fixed, well, it wouldn't seem very neighborly to go on deceiving you. I admit I've left a pretty financial tangle behind me, and that if the cops ever do catch up with me, I'll have one deuce of a lot to answer for. You know, said Conway, it's curious when you come to think about it, out of four people picked up by chance and kidnapped a thousand miles, three are able to find some consolation in the business. You want a rest cure and hiding place? Miss Brinklow feels a call to evangelize. Who's the third person you're counting? said Manson. Not me, I hope. No. No, I was including myself, said Conway. And my own reason is perhaps the simplest of all. I just rather like being here. Indeed, a short time later, when he took what had come to be his usual solitary evening stroll along the terrace or beside the lotus pool, he felt an extraordinary sense of physical and mental peace. It was perfectly true. He just rather liked being at Shangri-La. For a moment, his mind went back to the world they had left behind them, a world of diplomatic juggling, of international tensions, of fear and intolerance, a world split by differing ideologies and permanently trembling on the brink of self-destruction. But here, at Shangri-La, all was in deep calm. In a moonless sky, the stars were lit to the full, and a pale blue sheen lay upon the tops of the soaring mountains. Conway admitted to himself then that if, by some change of plan, the porters from the outside world were to arrive immediately, he would not be completely overjoyed. 
Suddenly, in the midst of his reflections, he was aware of a figure leaving the Lamasri and coming towards him. It was Chang. There was an odd air of suppressed excitement about him. Mr. Conway, I am proud to be a bearer of important news. So the porters had come before the time, thought Conway. But he was wrong. My dear sir, I congratulate you. You are about to receive a signal honor, one that is extraordinary and unprecedented. But what's happened, Chang? What is this all about? My dear Mr. Conway, I cannot stress your good fortune too strongly. Come, sir, follow me. You are someone to meet the master of us all, the High Lama of Shangri-La. Conway's eagerness grew in intensity as he accompanied Chang across the empty courtyards. They passed through rooms he'd never seen before, all of them rather dim and lovely in lantern light. And then they climbed a spiral staircase. The most striking thing about this part of the Lamasery was the dry, tingling warmth. As though all the windows were tightly closed and the central heating plant was working at full pressure. At last, Chang paused before a door. The High Lama will see you alone, he said. He opened the door for Conway to enter and closed it silently behind him. Conway stood hesitant, breathing the sultry atmosphere and accustoming his eyes to the gloom. Then he suddenly built up an impression of a dark curtained, low-roofed apartment simply furnished with tables and chairs. On one of these chairs sat a small, pale, wrinkled old man in Chinese dress. You are Mr. Conway, said the High Lama. Please sit down and have no fear. I am an old man and can do nobody any harm. I feel it an honour to be received by you. I thank you, my dear Conway. I shall call you that according to your English fashion. It is a moment of great pleasure for me. My sight is poor, but believe me, I am able to see you in my mind as well as with my eyes. I trust that you have been comfortable at Shangri-La since your arrival? Extremely so. I am glad. Chan has done his best for you, no doubt. He tells me you have been asking many questions about our community and its affairs. I am certainly interested in them. Then, if you can spare me a little time, I shall be pleased to give you a brief account of our foundation. There is nothing that I should appreciate more. That is what I had thought and hoped. I wish you now to listen to a story, the story of Shangri-La. In the year 1719, my dear Conway, four friars set out on a journey of discovery into the heart of Asia and their mission was to establish if any traces survived of the Christian communities that existed in Asia in the Middle Ages. And they travelled for many months, facing hardships which you may well imagine. Three died on the way before the fourth stumbled onto the track that leads into this valley. And here, to his joy and surprise, he found a friendly and prosperous population which showed him the utmost hospitality. He began to preach. The people were Buddhists, but willing to hear him. There was an ancient Lamasserie existing then on this same mountain shelf, but it was in a state of decay, so the friar conceived the idea of setting up on this magnificent site a Christian monastery. And under his supervision, the old buildings were repaired and largely reconstructed. And he himself began to live here in these buildings of Shangri-La when he was 53 years of age in the year 1734. Now, let me tell you about this man. 
Schnee muss Peru. Bei Luxemburg bei Bath. He had studied at Paris and other universities. And he was something of a scholar. He was fond of music and the arts. And he had a special aptitude for languages. He was born in 1681. When he was a young man, Marlborough had fought his campaigns in Europe. And as the years passed, the folk of the valley and the monks grew to obey him. And in time they came to venerate him also. And so he grew old, very old. And finally, in the year 1789, news descended to the valley that Father Perrault was dying at last. He lay in this room, my dear Conway, where he could see from the window. He gathered his friends and his servants around him and bade them all farewell. Then he asked to be left alone for a while. It was during such a solitude with his body sinking and his mind lifted to beatitude that he had hoped to give up his soul. But it did not happen so. He lay for many weeks without speech or movement, and then he began to recover. He was a hundred and eight. In the fourth year of the 19th century, a, a second stranger from Europe arrived in the valley. He was a young Austrian named Henschel, who had soldiered against Napoleon in Italy, and a strong friendship developed between him and Perrault. Henschel began our collections of Chinese art, as well as our library. He made a remarkable journey to Pekin and brought back the first consignment in the year 1809. As you may have discovered, the valley is rich in gold. There was never any difficulty in obtaining things from the outside world. Oh, yes, Shangri-La is quite as much to Henschel as to Peru, its founder. His loss would have been altogether irreparable had he not completed more than a lifetime's work before he died. Conway looked up to echo rather than question these final words. He died? Yes. Yes, it was very sudden. It was in the uh, of your Indian mutiny. Just before his death, the Chinese artist sketched him. I can show you that sketch now. It's in this room. Look. The High Lama drew aside a curtain. The features were of great beauty, but the face was that of a young man. You said this was done just before his death? Yes. It is a very good likeness. And, and Henschel came here, told me, in 1803, more than half a century before, when he was already a grown man. Yes, my dear Conway. What is it you want to say to me? What can you guess after this long story of mine? Conway's brain swam as he sought to answer the question. He had listened to the narrative with an intentness that had shielded him from its full implication. Now, he was flooded with amazement. It seems impossible, he said. Incredible. And yet, not absolutely beyond my powers of belief. What is it, my son? What is it that you believe? I believe that you are still alive, Father Pero. That was episode six of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the seventh of ten episodes. 
After some weeks in Shangri-La, Conway was summoned before the incredibly aged High Lama, who described how the Lama Sri was rebuilt as a Christian monastery in 1734 by a middle-aged monk called Father Peru. What is it that you guess after my long story? said the High Lama. What is it that you believe, my son? I believe, said Conway. I believe that you are still alive, Father Perro. The High Lama said nothing, but bowed his head. A moment later he gave an imperceptible signal with his hand, and a servant padded in with bowls of tea. Conway didn't wonder at his call for refreshment, for the strain of such a long recital must have been considerable. When the bowls had been cleared away, Conway said, So, you intend to keep us here, Father? You have guessed correctly, my son. What puzzles me is why we four, out of all the rest of the world's inhabitants, should have been chosen. It is an intricate story. You must know that we have always aimed as far as possible to keep up our numbers. Unfortunately, since the recent war, travel and exploration in Tibet have been almost completely held up. In fact, our last visitor arrived in 1912 and was not to be candid a very valuable acquisition. A few years ago, however, one of our number came to the rescue with a novel idea, to bring us additional colleagues by a method which would have been impossible in an earlier age. You mean, said Conway, that he was sent out deliberately to bring somebody back by air? Yeah, he was a resourceful youth, and we had great confidence in him. It was his own idea, and we allowed him a free hand in carrying it out. All that we knew definitely was that the first stage of his plan included a period of tuition at an American flying school. Yes, I see, said Conway. But the biggest question of all I have left unasked until now. I have heard with interest all you have said about the foundation of this establishment, about the need for recruitment, about the methods that you've used, but perhaps now you'll tell me. What is the idea behind it all? Ah, uh, my son, I will be happy to impart to you the secret of Shangri-La. All I ask is that what I tell you now shall remain for the present unknown to your three companions. Now, we do not follow an idle experiment here at Shangri-La. We have a dream and a vision. It is a vision that first appeared to me when I lay dying, as I believed, here in this very room, almost a century and a half ago. I looked back on what was then already a long life, and it seemed to me that war, greed, brutality might someday crush and obliterate the things that really matter. I saw nations more and more determined to destroy, and I believed that when they'd filled the land and the sea with ruin, they would take to the air. Can you say that my vision was untrue? No, indeed no, said Conway. Your vision was true. Uh, but that was not all. It seemed there would come a time when men would rage so hotly over the world that every precious thing would be in danger, every book, picture, every treasure garnered through the ages, all would be lost. Conway thought of the world he had left behind him, the tensions, the dangers, the fears. I think you may be right, he said. I think you may be right. Believe me, my son, that vision will come true. I say it in sorrow, and that is why I am here, and why you are here, and why we may pray 
to outlive the doom that gathers round us on every side. To outlive it? Yes, my son, for you there is a chance. You think Shangri-La will escape? Oh, perhaps, my son, perhaps. We may expect no mercy, but we may hope for neglect. Here we shall stay with our books and our music and our meditations. We have a heritage to cherish and bequeath. And then, my son, when the strong have devoured each other, the Christian ethic may at last be fulfilled, and the meek shall inherit the earth. The old man's voice ended, and for a long time Conway remained seated amid the shadows as if in a trance. He never remembered how he took his leave. It was like a dream from which he didn't emerge until long afterwards. He only remembered the night air, icy after the heat of those upper rooms, and sensed Chang's presence as they crossed the starlit courtyards. Never had Shangri-La offered more concentrated loveliness to his eyes. Chang did not speak, and neither did he. It was very late, and he was glad that all the others had gone to bed. In the morning, he wondered if everything that he could call to mind were part of a waking or sleeping vision. But he was soon reminded. A chorus of questions greeted him when he appeared at breakfast. Ah, you certainly had a long talk with the boss last night, said Barnard. We may not wait up for you, but we got tired. Huh. What kind of a guy is he? Did he say anything about the porters, said Mallinson. I hope, I, I hope you mentioned to him about having a missionary stationed here, said Miss Brinklow. I'm afraid, I'm afraid I'm probably going to disappoint you all. I did not discuss with him the question of missions. He didn't mention the porters to me at all. As for his appearance, I can only say he's a very old man who speaks excellent English and is very intelligent. Do you think he means to let us down? Well... He didn't strike me as a dishonourable person. Why on earth didn't you worry him about the porters, then? To be quite honest, Mallinson, it didn't occur to me. Mallinson stared at him. What's going on here? That's what I want to know. I just can't face all this mystery. That, that Chinese girl, Lo Tsen, for instance, how did she get here? Did the fellow tell you that? No. Why should he? Well, why shouldn't he? And why didn't you ask? Well, I don't reckon you folks will value my opinion any, said Barnard. But since we got to be here for some time yet, let's uh, keep our tempers, huh? And make yourselves comfortable. Oh, yes, said Mallinson. I can quite believe you find it more comfortable here than in Sing Sing. Now, of course... Chang talked to Conway completely without reserve. Chang, how about the process of retarding age? It is partly a natural process occasioned by the atmosphere of the valley. I am now 97. If I remained away from the valley for more than a very few days, I should die. Even if I had left some 30 years ago when I had the appearance of a man of 30, I should very quickly have acquired the look of my actual age. <laughs> That's rather grim, Chang. It gives one the feeling that time is like some monster waiting outside the valley to pounce on those who have managed to evade him longer than they should. During the course of a week or so after the interview with the High Lama, Conway met several other members of the Lama Sri and enjoyed his first talk with Alphonse Briac, a wiry, small-statured Frenchman who didn't look especially old, though he announced himself as having been a pupil of Chopin, who had died in 1849. As the days drifted into weeks, Conway was discovering happiness. When he sat playing Chopin in the music room, he often felt a peace that he had never known before. He would sometimes listen to Lord Sen playing some intricate fugue on the harpsichord. She talked very little, even though she now knew that Conway could speak her language. 
With Mallinson, who liked to visit the music room sometimes, she was almost dumb. Once, Conway asked Chang about her. He learned she came of royal Manchu stock. She was betrothed to a prince of Pakistan and was traveling to meet him when her carriers lost their way in the mountains. And when did this happen? In 1884. She was 18. But <laughs> she looks no more than 30 now. If that... Once he asked Chang when he could expect to see the High Lama again. Oh, doubtless at the end of your first five years, my dear sir, was the answer. But in that confident prophecy, Chang was wrong. For less than a month after his arrival at Shangri-La, Conway received a second summons to that torrid upper room. Chang had told him that the High Lama never left his apartment and that their heated atmosphere was necessary for his bodily existence. Conway, being prepared, found the change of temperature less disconcerting than before. As soon as he had made his bow and received a faint response, he breathed more easily. He and the High Lama exchanged all the usual courtesies, and Conway answered the many polite questions. He said he was finding the life very agreeable, and he had already made friendships. And you have kept our secrets from your three companions. Chang has told me about them. The lady, Miss Brinklow, he says she is eager to stay and preach in the valley. Yes, that is so. She has spent many years as a missionary in China, and she believes that Providence has guided her to Shangri-La. She has decided to answer the call, it seems. She has certainly taken up the study of the language as a first step. Mm. And the American Barnard, Chang tells me that he too is quite settled. His motives may be questionable, but he has certainly accepted the situation with cheerfulness. I don't believe he would leave the valley now, even if he were offered the opportunity. And so we come to the third member of your party. I speak of Mr. Mallinson. Well, Mallinson's an excitable youth. He's pretty keen to get home. I know of Mr. Mallinson and of what passes in his mind. It is on his account that I have asked you to come here. I want to warn you. Mr. Mallinson can endanger everything we hold precious here at Shangri-La. Be on your guard against that young man, day and night. That was episode seven of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the eighth of ten episodes. Extraordinary, Chang said when he heard that Conway had seen the High Lama again. It has never happened before since the Lama Sri was re-established. Never has a High Lama desired a second meeting until the end of a five years probation. Extraordinary. To Conway, of course, it was no more extraordinary than anything else. And after he had seen the High Lama on a third and a fourth occasion, he began to feel it wasn't very extraordinary at all. As the days and weeks passed, he felt contentment, almost like a physical ache. Shangri-La had woven its spell, and Conway had fallen under it. The gleaming mountains, the green valley, the lotus pool, all combined to produce a perfect setting, and he was happy. Then, at intervals, he stepped into the other life to encounter Mallinson's impatience, Barnard's heartiness, and Miss Brinkler's robust intention. He was amused when Barnard once said, Ah, oh, you know, Conway, I'm not sure that this wouldn't be a nice little place to settle down in. 
I thought at first I'd miss the newspapers and the movies, but I guess one can get used to anything. Conway learned afterwards that Chung had taken Barnard down to enjoy what the valley could provide in the way of a convivial evening. Of course, it's none of my business, said Mallinson when he heard, but you know, Barnard, you'll want to keep yourself pretty fit for the journey. The porters are due in a fortnight's time, and from what I gather, the return trip won't be exactly a joyride. Well, I never figured it would, said Barnard. As for keeping fit, I reckon I'm fitter than I have been for years. Anyway, the speakeasies down in the valley don't let a fella go too far. And you can't blame a man for what he fences. You can't send him to jail, though, when he fences other people's property, said Madison. Ah, well, sure. If you can catch him. And that leads me to something I may as well tell you folks right away, now that we're on the subject. I've decided to give those porters a miss. I guess they come here pretty regular. I'll wait for the next trip. Oh, maybe the one after that. Do you mean that you're not coming with us? Said Mallinson. <laughs> In other words, you're just afraid to face the music. Well, nobody can prevent you from stopping here all your life if you feel so inclined. It's not what everybody would choose to do, but ideas differ. Miss Brinklow suddenly put down her book and said, As a matter of fact, I think that I shall stay too. You see, I've been thinking over the way things happen to bring us all here, and there's only one conclusion that I can come to. I was sent here for a purpose, and I shall stay. Do you mean that you're hoping to start a mission here? said Mallinson. Not only hoping, Mr. Mallinson, but fully intending. I know just how to deal with these people. Don't forget that I've had more than twenty years' experience of working in the Far East. Oh, I shall get my own way. Never fear. Why, it's just like I said, said Barnard. This establishment caters for all tastes. Yes, possibly if you happen to like prison, said Mallinson. Well, after their discussion, Mallinson took Conway aside. That man Barnard still gets on my nerves. I'm not sorry we shan't have him with us when we go back. Conway, have you solved any of the mysteries of this place yet? That, that Chinese girl, uh, Lu Tsen, for example, I can't make out why she's here and whether she likes being here. As if only I spoke her language, as you do. I shouldn't worry about Lord Sen, if I were you, said Conway. She's happy enough. Some time later, Conway spoke to Chang. You know, Chang, I'm rather worried about Manson. I'm afraid he'll take things very badly when he finds out. He's counting the days to the arrival of the porters, and you'll find it hard to stop him from joining them. Bah, my dear Mr. Conway, we should never attempt to do so. He will merely discover that the porters are reluctantly unable to take anybody back with them. I'm not so sure that that will deter him. He is quite likely to try and escape on his own. Escape, Mr. Conway? Is that really the word? After all, the pass is open to anyone at any time. We have no jailers except those that nature herself has provided. Well, you must admit that she's done her job pretty well. But the question of Mallinson, like so much else, was in the mundane world that was gradually being pushed out of his mind by the rich, pervasive world of Shangri-La. He didn't think he'd ever been so happy. He loved this serene world of Shangri-La, the mannered, leisurely atmosphere. Occasionally, though, the spell was broken for him. There was the time when Barnard came up to him confidentially. Can't we? I'm telling you this because you're different from Madison. Now, he's got his knife in him, as you probably gathered. Now, you and me, we're men of the world, and we take things as we find them, huh? Well, what's all this leading up to? Gold, boy. Just that tons of it, literally, in the valley. I was a mining engineer in my young days, and I haven't forgotten what a reef looks like. And that fella Chang, you see, he's a real decent guy. He showed me all over the workings. 
and it may interest you to know that I've got the full permission of the authorities to prospect in the valley as much as I like. Now, what do you think of that? They seem quite glad to have the services of an expert, especially when I said I could probably give them tips on how to increase the output. Oh. I can see that you're going to be all together at home here, said Conway. Well, I must say I found a job. Well, that's something. Conway was glad that Barnard had found something that yielded much immediate comfort. And so was the High Lama. Conway began to see the High Lama more and more frequently. He often went to see him in the late evening and stayed for many hours. The High Lama never failed to ask him about the progress and welfare of his three companions, and once he inquired particularly as to the kind of careers that their arrival at Shangri-La had so inevitably interrupted. Well, Mallinson might have done quite well in the consular service, said Conway. He's energetic and has ambitions. As for the other two, well, it happens to suit both of them to stay here for a while, at any rate. He noticed a flicker of light at the curtained window. There had been mutterings of thunder as he crossed the courtyards on his way to the now familiar room. But here, no sound could be heard and the heavy tapestries subdued the lightning into mere sparks of pallor. The mountain sends us storms at this time of the year, said the High Lama. But we were discussing your young friend, Mr. Mallinson, to whom neither gold nor religion can offer solace as it does to the others. What of him? Yes, said Conway. He is going to be the problem. I am afraid, my son, that he is going to be your problem. Why? Why mine, particularly? Because, my son, I am going to die. The High Lama's statement was so unexpected that it left Conway speechless. After a few moments, the old man said, Are You are surprised? And surely, my friend, we are all mortal, even at Shangri-La. I don't know how much time I may have left to me, and all I announce is the simple truth that already I can see the end. I want to do only one thing more. Can you imagine what that is? Conway remained silent. It concerns you, my son. You do me a great honour. I have it in mind to do much more than that. My son, I place in your hands the heritage and destiny of Shangri-La. His words seemed to echo again and again in Conway's mind. Then slowly they faded and all he could hear was his own heartbeat pounding like a gong. I have waited for you, my son, for a long time. I have sat in this room and seen the faces of newcomers. I have looked into their eyes and heard their voices, and always in the hope that some day I might find you. My colleagues have grown old and wise, but you who are still young in years are as wise already. My friend, it is not an arduous task that I bequeath, for our order knows only silken bonds. To be gentle and patient, to care for the riches of the mind, to preside in wisdom and secrecy while the storm rages outside. It will all be pleasant and simple for you, and you will doubtless find great happiness. A vivid lightning flash paled the shadows. This storm said Conway. This storm you talk of. Uh, it will be such a one, my son, as the world has not seen before. It will rage till every flower is trampled and all human things are leveled in a vast chaos. Such was my vision when Napoleon was still a name unknown, and I see it now more clearly with each hour. Uh, so you say that I am mistaken. No, no. 
No, I think you may be right. And, and you think that all this will come in my time? I believe that you will live through the storm, my son, and after, through the long age of desolation, you may still live. And beyond that, my vision weakens. But I see at a great distance a new world stirring in the ruins, seeking its lost and legendary treasures. And they will all be here, my son, hidden behind the mountains, here in Shangri-La, preserved as by a miracle for a new Renaissance. The High Lama stopped speaking, and Conway saw the face before him full of a remote and overpowering beauty. Then the glow faded, and there was nothing left but a mask, dark shadowed, drained of life. It was quite motionless, and the eyes were closed. Conway watched for a while, and presently it came to him. The High Lama was dead. He was quite alone in the room now. The mantle had fallen upon him. That was episode eight of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the ninth of ten episodes. Conway stood watching the High Lama's lifeless face, now a dark shadowed mask. Behind the tiny dead figure in this hothouse room, the tapestries stirred in an alien breeze, as though the storm in the outside world would break through into the Lama Sri of Shangri-La. As he crossed the room to the door, it occurred to Conway he didn't in the least know how to summon help. The Tibetans he knew had all been sent away for the night, and he had no idea where to find Chang or anyone else. He stood uncertainly on the threshold of the dark corridor, lost in the wonder of that final astonishing interview with the High Lama. At last he stumbled into the courtyards and by the fringe of the lotus pool. And then suddenly he was aware that Mallinson was near him, holding his arm, leading him away in a great hurry. He didn't gather what it was all about, but he could hear that Mallinson was chattering excitedly. So they reached the balconied room where they had meals, Mallinson still clutching his arm and half dragging him along. Come on, Conway. We've got till dawn to pack what we can and get away. Great news, man. I wonder what old Barnard and Miss Brinkley will think in the morning when they find us gone. The porters are about five miles beyond the pass. They came yesterday with loads of books and things. Tomorrow they begin the journey back. I say, what's the matter? Are you ill? Conway had sunk into a chair and was leaning forward, elbows on the table. Ill? No, I don't think so. Just rather tired. Hmm. Probably the storm. Where were you all the time? I've been waiting for you for hours. I I'm sorry, said Conway. I'm still not quite with you. you. You say the porters... Yes, the porters. They're there waiting in the valley. We've got to get down and join them. You're thinking of going down to them. I suppose you realise it mayn't be quite as simple as it sounds. Well, fortunately, Conway... I haven't you to rely on for arranging things, because they've been arranged. The porters are paid in advance, and, and they've agreed to take us. And here are clothes and equipment for the journey already. So, your last excuse disappears. Well, come on, let's do something. But I don't understand, said Conway. Who's been making all these plans? Hmm, well, if you must know, the Chinese pianist you're so fond of listening to, Lo Tsen. She's done everything. 
And she's with the porters now. She's waiting. Lord Sam. Uh, waiting? Yes. Well, she's coming with us. I assume you've no objection. But this is nonsense, Mallinson. It's quite impossible. Uh, there are all sorts of reasons, but take my word for it, it won't do. It's incredible enough that she should be down there now, but the idea of her going any further, it's just preposterous. I don't see that it's preposterous at all, said Mallinson. It's just as natural for her to want to leave here as for me, but she doesn't want to leave. That's where you make the mistake. Then why did she say she'd come? I asked her. In Tibetan. Miss Brinkler worked out the words. It wasn't a very fluid conversation, but it was quite enough to... well, to lead to an understanding. On a sudden impulse, Conway said, Let me explain something to you. When you've heard what I've got to tell you, you will understand, I hope, a great deal of what now seems very curious and very difficult. At any rate, you'll realise why Lord Sen can't possibly go back with you. Conway then gave, as briefly as he could, the whole story of Shangri-La as told him by the High Lama. It was the last thing he ever intended to do, but he felt that in the circumstances it was justified and even necessary. Only one thing he withheld, the fact of the High Lama's death that night and of his own succession. And when he had finished, he looked up calmly, confident that he'd done well. But Mallinson merely said, I really don't know what to say, Conway, except that you must be completely mad. What such other nonsense? It seems to me rather beyond arguing about. You think it's... it's nonsense? Well, how else can I look at it? I won't say that the story of a fellow sent out to decoy strangers back here is literally impossible, though it does seem to me ridiculously far-fetched, but when you tack it on to all sorts of other things that are absolutely impossible, well, all this about the llamas being hundreds of years old, well, it just makes me wonder what's going into you. Yes, I dare say you find it hard to believe. Perhaps I did myself at first. Well, of course, it is an extraordinary story, but think of all that we've actually seen, both of us. A lost valley in the midst of unexplored mountains. A monastery with a library of European books. Oh, yes, said Manson. And a central heating plant and modern plumbing and, and afternoon tea and everything else. Oh, it's all very marvellous, I know. Now, oh, look here, Conway. It's got on your nerves, this place, and I really don't wonder at it. Well, pack up your things, and let's quit. I'm sorry, Mallinson. I have no desire to go back at all. You're going to stay here like the other two. Hmm. And at least you won't stop me from clearing out of it. Oh, goodbye, Mallinson. For the last time, are you coming? I can't. Goodbye. They shook hands, and Mallinson left. Conway sat alone in the lantern light, still in the dream that had persisted since his last interview with the High Lama. It seemed to him that the outside world and Shangri-La were finally beyond reconciliation. He was still at the table hours later, smoking the last of his cigarettes, when... Mallinson returned. Hello? What's happened? Why are you back? Mallinson pulled off his heavy sheepskins and sat down. His face was white. Well, I hadn't the nerve, he said. That place where we were all roped together on the way here, do you remember? Yes, well, I got as far as that, but well, I couldn't manage it. I've no, I've no head for heights, and in the moonlight it, it looked terrifying. Well, silly, isn't it? Oh, they needn't worry, these llamas here. Nobody will ever threaten them by land, but by God, I'd give a good deal to fly over with a load of bombs. Uh, why would you do that, Manson? Because the place wants smashing up. It's all wrong. And if your impossible yarn were true, it would be more hateful still. 
lot of wizened old men crouching here like spiders, waiting for anybody who comes near. It's horrible. You know, who'd want to live to an age like that anyway? Oh, why won't you come away with me, Conway? I hate imploring you for my own sake, but well, after all, I'm young. Does my whole life mean nothing to you? And Lord Sand, too. She's young. Doesn't she count at all? Lord Sand is not young, said Conway. She looks 17, but she's older. Much, much older. Oh, you're raving, Conway, you're raving. Her beauty, Mallinson, is a fragile thing. Take it away from the life-giving air of this valley and you will see it fade like an echo. Now, look, tell me seriously, Conway, what evidence have you got for this story of yours? What proofs? None at all, as far as I can see. Well, has Lotsen ever told you her history? No, Melanson, she hasn't, but... Then why believe it from somebody else? And all this old age business, can you point to a single outside fact in support of it? You've seen a few old men, that's all it amounts to. Oh, be honest, Conway. I really can't see why you should believe everything you're told just because you're in Tibet. Conway nodded, unable to restrain approval of a point well made. And after a moment he said, There's just one question that I would like to ask. Are you in love with Lord Sin? Yes, I am, Conway. I know you say it's absurd and unthinkable, it probably is, but... I can't help my feelings. No, I don't think it's absurd at all. Well, what nonsense it all is about her not being young. Oh, Conway, you can't believe it. It's just too ridiculous. Are you quite, quite sure that she's young? Well, positive, Conway, she's just a girl. And our falling in love is about the only good thing that's ever happened in this place. Conway went to the balcony and gazed at the dazzling mountain that soared behind the Lamasery. The moon was riding higher in a waveless ocean. Her dream had dissolved, like all too lovely things at the first touch of reality. And he saw that the whole world's future weighed in the balance against youth and love would be as nothing. He didn't know whether he had been mad and was now sane, or whether, for a brief moment, he had been sane and was now mad again. But when he turned round from the window, there was a difference in him. He looked much more like the Conway who'd first come to Shangri-La. Do you... Do you think you could manage that tricky descent with a rope, Marinson? If I were with you, he said. Marinson sprang forward. You mean, you've made up your mind at last. You'll come with us, Conway. They left as soon as Conway had prepared himself for the journey. It was surprisingly simple to leave, a departure rather than an escape. There were no incidents as they crossed the bars of moonlight and shadow in the courtyards. One might have thought there was nobody there at all, Conway reflected. And the idea of such emptiness became an emptiness in himself. How strange that this secret sanctuary should be forsaken by one who had found in it such happiness. For indeed, less than an hour later, they halted breathlessly at a curve of the track and saw the last of Shangri-La. Deep below them, the valley was like a cloud, and Conway, the scattered roofs, had a look of floating after him through the haze. He prepared the rope for the knife-edged traverse, and though Mallinson was nervous at the precipice, Conway got him over in traditional mountaineering fashion. When that trial was passed, they paused, and Mallinson tried to express something of what he was feeling. Conway, I must say it's damn good of you. <laughs> I can't tell you how glad I am. I wouldn't try then, if I were you. Well, I am glad. Not only for my own sake, but for yours as well. It's fine that you can realise now that all those tales about eternal youth are sheer nonsense. It's just wonderful to see you, your real self again. That was episode nine of Lost Horizon by James Hilton.
It was read by Geoffrey Matthews. Lost Horizon by James Hilton. Geoffrey Matthews reads the final episode. Towards dawn, Conway and Mallinson passed unchallenged by sentinels through the valley below Shangri-La. Presently they reached a plateau beyond, picked clean as a bone by roaring winds, and after a gradual descent, the encampment of porters came in sight. Then, all was as Mallinson had foretold. They found the men ready for them, sturdy fellows in furs and sheepskins crouching under the gale, and eager to begin the journey to Tachin Fu, 1,100 miles eastward on the China border. When they met Lord Sen, Mallinson said, Conway is coming with us, forgetting that she knew no English. But Conway translated. It seemed to him that the little Manchu woman had never looked so radiant. She gave him a most charming smile, but her eyes were all for the boy. And it was at this point that the manuscript I was reading, the manuscript that Rutherford had given me, came to an end. I had intended to return it to him as soon as I had read it, but I had already received a short note from him to say that he was off on his wanderings again and would have no settled address for some months. It was in Delhi that I met Rutherford again. We had been guests at a vice-regal dinner party, but distance and ceremonial kept us apart until the turbaned flunkies handed us our hats afterwards. Come back to my hotel, have a drink, Rutherford said. Over a whiskey, I asked him where he'd been. Searching for Conway, I said. <laughs> search is much too strong a word. You can't search a country half as big as Europe for one man. All I can say is that I visited places where I was prepared to come across him or get news of him. His last message, you remember, was that he had left Bangkok on a long journey. I knew that it was to the northwest, and I was able to follow him some way. But the definite trail, as you might say, peters out somewhere in Upper Siam. But I was also interested to put as many tabs on Conway's story as I could. Altogether, I must have done some thousands of miles. Baskul, Bangkok... Chungkyang, Kashgar, I visited them all, and somewhere inside the area between them the mystery lies. But it's a pretty big area, you know, and all my investigations didn't touch more than the fringe of it, or of the mystery either, I admit. Huh? Indeed, if you want the actual downright facts about Conway's adventures, so far as I've been able to verify them, all I can tell you is that he left Baskal on the 20th of May and arrived in Chungkyang on the 5th of October. And the last we know of him is that he left Bangkok again on the 3rd of February. All the rest, everything he told me, everything I wrote down in that manuscript, is probability, possibility, guesswork, myth, legend, whatever you like to call it. But... Did you discover nothing definite at Baskul? I said. Oh, Baskul was hopeless, said Rutherford. Peshawar was worse. Nobody could tell me anything except that the kidnapping of the people in that aeroplane did undoubtedly take place. Nobody's keen even to admit that, of course. <laughs> it's an episode they're not proud of. And nothing was heard of the plane afterwards. Not a word or a rumour, or of its four passengers either. I verified, however, that it was a type capable of climbing high enough to cross the ranges. I also tried to trace that fellow Barnard. I found his past history so mysterious that I wouldn't be at all surprised if he really were Chalmers Bryant, as Conway said. Did you try to find anything about the actual kidnapper? I asked. I did, but again it was hopeless. And did you try tracing the history of some of the people that Conway mentioned? 
I made an attempt, but it's a pity I hadn't a longer list to work on. I couldn't find any record of a pupil of Chopin's called Briac. Though, of course, that doesn't prove that there wasn't one. Conway was pretty sparing with his names, when you come to think about it. Out of 50-odd llamas supposed to be on the premises, he only gave us one or two. Pero and uh, Hensel, by the way, proved equally impossible to trace. How about Mallinson? I said. Did you try to find out what happened to him? And that girl, the Chinese girl. Oh, my dear fellow, of course I did. The awkward part was, as you perhaps gathered from the manuscripts, that Conway's story ended at the moment of leaving the valley with the porters. After that, he either couldn't or would not tell me what had happened. Perhaps he might have done, mind you, if there'd been more time. I feel that we can guess at some sort of tragedy. The hardships of the journey would be perfectly appalling, apart from the risk of brigandage or even treachery among their own escorting party. Probably we shall never know exactly what did occur, but it seems tolerably certain that Melanson never reached China. I made all sorts of inquiries, you know. There was absolutely no record of Conway's party arriving at all. So how Conway himself reached Chongqiang is still unexplained, I said. Uh, the only conclusion, said Rutherford, is that he wandered there, just as he might have wandered anywhere else. Anyway, we're back in the realm of hard facts when we get to Chongqiang, eh? that's something. The nuns at the mission hospital were genuine enough, and so for the matter was the excitement of that pianist, Sieve King, when Conway played that pseudo Chopin on the ship. Rutherford paused. Yeah. It's really an exercise in the balancing of probabilities, and I must say the scales don't bump very emphatically either way. Of course, if you don't accept Conway's story, it means that you doubt either his veracity or his sanity. One might as well be frank. He paused again, and I said, As you know, I never saw him after the war, but I understand he was a good deal changed by it. Yes. Yes, he certainly was. Well, there's no denying the fact. People would say, I suppose, that he came through without a scratch. But the scratches were there on the inside. So that's where we must leave it, I said. Well, yes, except for just one more point that I must mention, and perhaps in some ways it's the oddest of all. It came out during my inquiries at the mission. They all did their best for me there, as you can guess, but they couldn't recollect much, especially as they'd been so busy with the fever epidemic at the time. One of the questions I put was about the manner Conway had reached the hospital first of all, whether he had presented himself alone or had been found ill and been taken there by somebody else. I couldn't exactly remember. After all, it was a long while back. But suddenly, when I was on the point of giving up the cross-examination, one of the nuns remarked quite casually, I think the doctor said he was brought here by a woman. Ah, that was all she could tell me. And as the doctor himself had left the mission, there was no confirmation to be had on the spot. But, having got so far, I wasn't in any mood to give up. It appeared that the doctor had gone to a bigger hospital in Shanghai, so I took the trouble to get his address and call on him there. I'd met the man before, of course, during my first visit to Chongqiang, and he was very polite, though terribly overworked, he took me to one side in the crowded hospital ward, and I asked him about Conway. There wasn't a moment's hesitation. Oh, yes, he said. I remember the case of the Englishman who had lost his memory. I remember it very well. And was it true that he had been brought to the mission by a woman? I said. One of the nuns told me you had just said so. Oh, yes, certainly he said, by a woman, a Chinese woman. Do you remember anything about her? I said. 
He lifted his arms. Nothing, I'm afraid, except that she'd been ill of the fever herself and died almost immediately. And just then there was an interruption. A batch of sick were carried in and packed on stretchers in the corridors. The wards were all full, and I didn't care to go on taking up the man's time. And when he came back to me looking quite cheerful amid such ghastliness, I just asked him one final question. And I dare say you can guess what that was. About that Chinese woman, I said. Was she young? Rutherford flicked his cigar as if the narration had excited him quite as much as he hoped it had me. And then he went on. The little fellow looked at me solemnly for a moment, and then he answered, Oh, no. She was most old. Most old of anyone I have ever seen. We sat for a long time in silence, and then talked again of Conway as I remembered him, boyish and gifted and full of charm, and of so many mysteries of time and age and of the mind, and of the little Manchu woman who had been most old, and of the strange ultimate dream of Shangri-La. At length I looked across at Rutherford. Do you think he will ever find it, I asked. That was the final episode of Lost Horizon by James Hilton. It was read by Geoffrey Matthews, and production for the BBC was by John Carty. <laughs>